Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. The game of Dungeons & Dragons excels in a variety of areas. Combat, roleplay, exploration. But I would argue that there is one aspect of D&D that solidifies it as one of the best RPGs of all time. D&D is exceptional at rewarding player creativity. An entire community has sprung up around using the game's mechanics in the most optimal way. Pack Tactics, Triant Monk's Temple, Davy Chappie, Runesmith. All of these guys find new ways to make me feel like an idiot by blowing the game wide open. While personally, I'm the kind of guy who interprets character creation as an opportunity to make the most stupid and memeable characters possible, there are plenty of people out there who think that the most fun part of D&D is cracking the game like an egg and slurping up all the gooey game-breaking mechanics through a bendy straw. And let me tell you, nothing is more entertaining and simultaneously aggravating than when two of these eggheads disagree on the rules. The story I have for you today starts an arrogant man-child who thinks that he can abuse his godlike powers as a DM to create a level 80 DMPC, and how his player's insane knowledge of the game's mechanics brings about his downfall. Now, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes from user Taupasaurus, and is titled, Man announces that he'll show everyone what it means to be a real DM. Falls flat of expectations. Once upon a time, when we were younger and quite inexperienced, we ran a few campaigns with various acquaintances. We played at a school RPG club, and thus had no short supply of players. Of a very hit-and-miss caliber. My roommate and I, as well as some members of the group, would DM in alternance about twice a week. While the game had its flaws, we still had fun aplenty. Nobody was stuck in the perma-GM role, and things were always fresh, with various people bringing ideas to the table. Enter Bob. Bob was one of our newest recruits to the party, and he was the kind of player that would attempt a power game and play Oh, incredible characters, only to fall flat. My roommate had a great knowledge of the rules, and was himself the crowned king of munchkinism. If you showed up at his table with a combo that made you invincible, he could explain to you in detail why stuff didn't stack, or how you simply misread your abilities completely. Bob took that as a challenge and one day announced that he himself would be running a special adventure, where he would show us what it means to really DM. He had a scenario ready that would test the limits of our knowledge and tactical abilities. He also created a level 80 wizard for the occasion. Just to be clear, this was D&D. The rules are simple. We get to be level 11, or something in that range, and anything is permitted. Anything? asked my roommates. Or oh, anything. You'll need it. So this is actually something that I see a lot in new players. Can I help you? Hello, sir. I'm with the FBI. What's wrong? Are the Dark Elves back? We got a code blue. Did you remember to download Surfshark? What kind of question is that? Of course I downloaded a VPN. That's not what I asked you, Ding Dong. Did you download Surfshark? I just downloaded a generic VPN. Does it even matter? You f***ing idiot! Of course it matters! That's probably how they found us! Surfshark is the best VPN for protecting yourself from online surveillance. That fed at the front door probably found their way here using online tracking and data mining. And then they started spamming us with targeted ads. But why would the FBI do that? It doesn't matter. What does matter is that Surfshark encrypts everything we send through the internet, which stops unwanted intruders from taking our personal data. 
Plus, Surfshark comes equipped with Alert ID protection, so users get early warnings when someone tries to break into their online accounts. Okay, we got Surfshark installed. Now what? Same thing we do every time the government catches wind of us. We're leaving the country. Aw, oh, man! There's no way I can get all my stuff packed! That's the beauty of Surfshark, my little reptilian co-conspirator. Using the magic of Surfshark, we can change our location on the fly. Normally, I use it to access region lock TV shows and websites whenever I travel, but today, I got a better use for it. Congratulations, my cold-blooded compadre. We are now citizens of the People's Republic of Mexico. No habla ingles. Sorry, sweetie. It looks like they don't want to buy any cookies today. Crisis averted. Use the link in the description and the promo code DRAKE to get an extra 83% off and an extra three months of protection for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can try it out risk-free, but let's be honest, we all know you're gonna love it. Link is in the description. The invited players quickly split into two clans, Team Edgelord and Team Challenge Accepted. The members of Team Edgelord were very excited to show off their ultimate combos and races, and we ended up with such marvelous creations as Vampire Samurai Monk Half Dragon, which sounds like it's a party combination, but is actually just one of the characters. Those were honest attempts, and surely had strong racials and stats, but they paled in comparison to what my roommate prepared. Some players saw him theorycraft, and basically trusted him to build them an interesting pick. He started by making two generic clerics, with special prestige classes. And their main reason to exist was that, one, they were totally immune to basically all mind effects, and two, could remove such effects from the party, which would probably shut down a large amount of crap that was thrown at us. With heals, dispels, and counterspell at their disposal, they would form the backbone of our defensive setup. The true creation was a monstrosity enlarged ogre with supreme cleave and a club way larger than even he should have been able to wield. Was it stupid? Yes. Was it technically legal? Dude, f if I know. I was no stranger to the game, but I never really made a great character. In fact, I normally played a bard, and my own fun came from writing songs, and I would end up entering the challenge campaign as said bard. Mostly because Inspire Courage is neat, and someone joined last minute. To them, I offered Virgil's character sheet. Virgil wasn't very smart, nor was he particularly charismatic. In fact, Virgil couldn't even speak. Virgil was, however, very, very good at grappling. This was because Virgil was a colossal hamster. When Friend showed up to our session having heard of the challenge, I offered him Virgil, and simply played my bard. To disguise this surprise from the DM, we used a polymorph spell on Virgil, to pass him off as a human, albeit one that would constantly twitch and sniff around. For the whole two weeks that the character creation took, some of us had doubts. Were we going too hard? However, every time that we saw Bob, he would remind us that we were not ready for his amazing game, and soon we would see what it would be like to play with a real DM. Oh. Thus, we marched on with our stat crunching. I don't know who needs to hear this, but there is no correct way to be a DM. The art of DMing is exactly that, an art. And by its very definition, there is no objectively correct way to do it. It's not like being a part of a bomb squad, where there's only one objective way to do your job, and if you think outside of the box, you're an idiot who's gonna get everyone killed. Unlike defusing a bomb, there are endless ways to DM in a satisfactory manner. 
You have DMs who are mostly focused on combat and mechanics, DMs who focus on storytelling, DMs who emphasize role playing, and DMs who don't lie to themselves and just improv the whole session. Each of these DMs are going to run vastly different games from one another, and each of them are going to have their own definition of what's fun. Sometimes you end up getting DMs whose DMing style just isn't compatible with their players, and that's fine. They could just find new players. But approaching people as if your DMing style is the best way to DM isn't just irritating, but it's also a red flag to any of your potential players. So next time you see someone complaining that their DM isn't like Matthew Mercer, Matthew Colville, or Arcadum, wait, scratch that. If anyone wants their DM to be like Arcadum, they deserve a brick to the back of the fucking head. So next time you see someone complaining that their DM isn't like Matthew Mercer or Matthew Colville, take solace in the simple fact that their opinion, unlike your DMing style, is wrong. The great day comes, and we are greeted by a level 80 wizard named Bob. The greatest wizard ever known. And that wizard has conjured us all to a magical hall for a feast to impart upon us the most glorious of quests. It would soon become apparent that despite being twice the CR of an actual deity, Bob the wizard was not the most versed in the rules. But his ability to rewrite them on the fly had carried him to great heights of power. His first action was to ask us if any of us were under any sort of magical effect, compulsion, or curse. Since we were under a permanent, ultra-powerful zone of truth emanating from Bob's armpits or whatever, we felt like we had to point out the twitchy human and say, Him. He has a magical polymorph on him. This all-powerful wizard, somehow not having mastered true-seeing, proudly explains... Come forth, my protege, and be free from all of your magical bonds. Oh. He was instantly crushed by his own feast hall crumbling to pieces, as a normal-sized dude reverted to being twice the size of the building he was in. The table rejoiced at this beautiful first impression. Bob the wizard kept his cool and simply wished the debris away, and pretended to be unfazed. Bob the DM attempted to do the same, albeit less convincingly. We were immediately sent upon a quest to retrieve four elemental artifacts from incredible challenges. Only our intervention could stop dark forces from reuniting the orbs and doing... a thing. An evil thing to the world. Probably. The greatest adventure, led by a true DM, was apparently very lacking in terms of build-up, flavor, or originality. But we were the nine chosen heroes, and so we departed on our quest to defeat hordes of monsters and gather our first item. Bob was very proud of his gauntlet, and army of aquatic monsters attempting to swarm us. Sadly for him, any amount of creatures with less than 100 HP would be immediately defeated by our Ogre Berserker, so long as at any point they were in 60 feet of one another. Bob attempted to overwhelm us with yet more monsters, failing to grab the subtleties of the Supreme Cleave, which basically makes you Darius from League of Legends. The challenges came and went. We sort of assumed that this impossible adventure would involve puzzles, dungeons, lore, and traps. Nope. It was just a large amount of monsters that we had to travel through. After vanquishing enough hordes, we'd obtain a MacGuffin and bring it back to Bob, who would send us on yet another long trek to get another orb. This went on for hours. This was meant to be a several weekend endeavor, but we were cruising through his minions faster than he could have ever anticipated. Bob, the greatest wizard in the world, asked us to get a third orb. We asked for a teleport. Bob said no. We asked why. Bob said that it was part of our challenge as the chosen heroes. We asked the obvious question of why he didn't just go and grab it himself. 
Bob said that he wouldn't do it because he was so powerful that intervening in this cross-country journey of Cleve and Critz would break the balance of the universe. We asked Bob for a teleport again, or we just wouldn't do it. Bob said no. Bob decided to reveal his true power, and mind controlled our party into doing the quest. This worked, except for our two clerics, who simply dismissed his ability party-wide. We asked for a teleport. Bob said that we would be retrieving the orbs or else. A quick glance across the table revealed our collective choice. People were very, very tired of this adventure, and of Bob's failure to deliver the greatest adventure any player had ever seen. Many of our party were themselves DMs who had hosted Bob, and felt like it was kind of a dick move to announce that he was going to show them what it's like to play with a real DM. The verdict was passed. We had chosen or else. We were going to fuck up Bob. Bob won initiative, for he had the vampiric discipline of celerity. We rolled with it, and so did our eyes. Learning from his previous mistake, Bob attempted to mind control and disable our party cleric, so that they couldn't dispel his spells. This failed. He cast many spells to damage us, but the clerics and bard patched through the volley of arcane bullshit. Ooh. Then came Virgil the Giant Hamster's turn. Virgil has a lot of points in grappling. Bob does not. Bob is now grappled. On his turn, Bob invents new abilities allowing him to evade the grapple and free himself from the hamster's bite. With several actions due to his celerity and other vampiric powers, as well as his ability to cast any spell. However, Bob the Wizard is still bound by the rules of the universe, as well as DM Bob's knowledge of said universe. The phrase, you need a concentration check while grappled, or you can't do that while grappled, becomes a finely owned weapon in our group's hands. Slowly but very surely, Bob the Wizard's HP goes down. Bob's challenge turns out to be his undoing, for in his own words, Oh, you should be prepared for the ultimate challenge that cannot be beaten. Defeated, he describes his character insert falling to our party and somehow attempts to turn this into a victory for himself. Bob, as you finally vanquish the wizard, you can see that the orbs begin to turn dark. You have made a terrible mistake. By refusing the mighty wizard Bob's request, you have doomed the world. Oh, and soon the orbs will be used for evil. You will all be killed by your decision, oh. Virgil, I would like to chew up the wizard's corpse and eat it. End of story. Well, isn't that just the most ironic thing? You hype yourself up to be this god among men when it comes to DMing, and then your game devolves into player versus DM shenanigans. As if it could have ended any other way. Bob's fatal flaw here was believing that being a good DM involves beating your players. While DMs will often kill PCs, it shouldn't be their goal. If you can find me a good DM whose main objective is to overwhelm their players, I'll show you both a liar and someone with really bad taste. Now before we go, let's take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes from viewer Hey Eaglet, and depicts a truly dramatic scene. Thanks to a clever trick of the camera, it looks like a shot of me flying through the sky. But in reality, this is a picture taken of me running through clouds of tear gas, utilized by stormtroopers which were dispatched by the communist dictatorship of my home country, back before I fled to America. Ah, uh, this takes me back. <laughs> Muerte a los comunistas. 
Viva la revolución! Thank you again, Hey Eaglet, for submitting your art. If you want to see your artwork featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of doing YouTube, and it means the world to me that I can create content that inspires artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you feel like supporting the channel even further, Patreon and merchandise links are in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake.